Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today uh, on our webinar about our new report, Dangerous by Design. This is actually a report that we have been you know, producing since way back in 2009, showing how uh, uh, the, the danger of our roadway system uh, falls harshly on those trying to get around on foot, even when things were getting safer for folks inside a car. What we're talking about today is the fact that particularly in 2020, things have gotten more dangerous for absolutely everybody. Let me start by just telling you a little bit about our organization, Smart Growth America. We are a national nonprofit that envisions a country that no matter where you live or who you are, you can enjoy living in a place that is healthy, prosperous, and resilient. We empower communities through technical assistance, advocacy, and thought leadership to realize that vision of livable places, healthy people, and shared prosperity. In the webinar today, we are going to hear uh, about the findings of uh, Dangerous by Design, and we're also going to hear from our partners, uh, Ken Rose, the Chief of the Physical Activity and Health Branch at the Centers for Disease Control, and Charles Brown, founder and CEO of Equitable Cities. At the end of our presentation, we will reserve time for questions, and we ask that you include any questions you have uh, in the Q&A feature on Zoom. Uh, we will not be monitoring the chat for questions. We will be looking for the questions in the Q&A bar, so please put them there. Also, I want to let you know that this session is being recorded, so you will have access to it after we are done, including the slides uh, that will be available on that recording. And finally, you can find the report on our website, uh, www.smartgrowthamerica.org slash dangerous dash by dash design. And we invite you to go to the website, peruse the features, and uh, download and share the report. So let's go ahead and jump into the, I, I don't like to say highlights, well, they're really rather lowlights of the report. Uh, pedestrian fatalities are up by a staggering 62%, and they've been steadily rising uh, since 2009 when we started reporting on this. Um, this upward trend has been going on for more than a decade now, and it looks like the trend is getting worse and not just a little bit worse, but uh, going up rather sharply. The report also finds that 6,529 people were struck and killed while walking in 2020, an average of nearly 18 per day and a 4.7% increase over 29, even though driving decreased by uh, a really uh, surprising amount because of the COVID uh, shutdown. We saw driving go down about 13% and still saw a historic increase in the number of uh, uh, fatalities. From the Governor's Highway Safety Administration's preliminary estimates, we expect the increase for 2021 to be between 11 and 13% higher than 2020, another historic jump. If this number holds, it would be the highest number of pedestrian fatalities in 40 years. So what's going on? Congestion, something transportation agencies spend billions of dollars to eliminate, seems to have been slowing traffic and reducing deadly crashes. During COVID, with less traffic on the roads, car speeds increased to more free-flowing conditions and the speeds that drivers feel most comfortable driving based on the wide highway-like road design that we find on most of our major roads across the country. That increase in speed led to more mistakes and those mistakes were more likely to be deadly. One thing that the pandemic did not change either uh, other than just the increase in fatalities, we also continue to see black and native Americans being killed at much larger numbers than white Americans on our roadways. Some other findings, uh, of the report are that uh, we were we were not in uh, good company in terms of deaths going up. Uh, our peer countries, other developed countries across the world, saw uh, fatalities go down with driving going down. Uh, something I've never liked is uh, we in this country believe that when driving goes up, 
fatalities go up when driving goes down, fatalities go down. There's a sense of inevitability to it as if we have no uh, capacity to control, manage, or prevent these deaths. Uh, uh, really the opposite of a vision zero approach. But other developed countries had a much better safety record uh, before COVID, and they saw their pedestrian fatalities decrease during the pandemic, while the United States continued to get worse, despite other variables being largely the same. We worked in partnership with Streetlight uh, data, and the, the data that they shared showed that walking trips increased during the pandemic in every state and metro area that we analyzed, regardless of weather, climate, geography, demographics. But more walking only led to more deaths in some places. Cities with higher historic com walking commuting rates had much lower increases in pedestrian fatality rates during the pandemic, or they even saw decreases. But much, much, they did much better than cities with low historic walking commute rates, despite similar increases in walking rates during the pandemic. So that's an overview of uh, Dangerous by Design, and we will dig deeper into the findings. But first, I want to invite our partner, Ken Rose, Chief of the Physical Activity and Health Branch within the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, his branch manages the Active People Healthy Nation Initiative, which uh, Smart Growth America is lucky enough to be a part of. Uh, and uh, was launched in January of 2020. And Ken, I'm going to turn things over to you. Oh, All right, thank you. So uh, good afternoon. I just wanna say it's a real honor to be invited to the kickoff for today's webinar. I have uh, read this report for years and am very honored to, to be a part of it. Uh, before I get started, uh, let me make sure that you know that the research I will discuss today is the work of those authors and does not necessarily represent the official position of the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I also want to say that I, as Beth said, am representing CDC's Active People Healthy Nation Initiative. And our goal is to get 27 million people more physically active by 2027. Next slide, please. So why do we care so much about walking? Well, because it promotes physical activity and most people get their physical activity through walking. It's important to note that also physical activity has many profound health benefits, including short and long-term health benefits. As this infographic shows, one single walk can improve sleep quality and reduce feelings of anxiety and blood pressure. And it also shows a range of profound long-term health benefits that are not related to weight. It promotes brain health by reducing depression and cognitive decline. Physical activity improves heart health by reducing heart disease and strokes. Physical activity reduces the risk of several cancers and it increases bone strength and balance. And all of these are benefits that are accrued in adulthood and older adulthood. Next slide. Dangerous by Design focuses on the tragic consequences of our dangerous roadways. Today, I'm also going to talk about and supplement these data with national data from peer-reviewed literature about how people perceive their environments, because perceptions are also important when people decide whether or not they want to take a walk to their local store, park, or school. So this slide shows that people report that they don't have access to safe streets. Only one in seven people nationwide reported that they had access to streets that made walking safe and easy and destinations that support walking like parks and trails. Next slide, please. Oh, somehow my visual got turned there, but that's probably more reflective of the, the reality anyway and the way people feel. Um, so uh, furthermore, people report that drivers don't follow the speed limit 
only one in three people in a nationwide sample reported that they lived in neighborhoods where drivers actually follow speed limits. And it's also important to note that concerns exist that speed limits are already set too high in places where people walk. Next slide, please. These concerns have contributed to the fact that only one in six parents reports that their youngest child walks to school. And roughly half of these parents report that they do not walk to school because they have concerns about dangerous traffic. Next slide, please. And it's clear that people want safer streets, even if making them safer makes driving slower. Over 80% of people in a nationwide sample reported that they wanted safer streets, even if it made driving slower. Next slide, please. So many of you have heard about the efforts by towns and cities to provide temporary places for physical activity during the early stages of the pandemic. This research is hot off the presses in June. Um, this national survey was conducted in the summer of 2020 and was intended to gauge whether pe what people experienced. So uh, the results were, what are they? Roughly one in four of those surveys reported that they had seen changed spaces for physical activity, like a safe, slow street. And of those people, over half reported an intent to use those spaces. It's interesting to note that Hispanics' intent to use this infrastructure was significantly higher than other racial and uh, ethnic demographic groups. Next slide, please. So I've talked about perceptions. I wanna finish my data to reinforce the, uh, my data discussion reinforcing um, some of the points that Beth made at the start with recent sobering data from CDC's own MMWR, which Probably everybody in the Zoom room knows what it is now after the last two years. Um, uh, but we also report other data in the MMWR uh, besides COVID. And this was a recent data reported about uh, motor vehicle crashes. Um, and so basically what it says is that the population motor vehicle crash death rate in the United States is higher than 28 other high income countries. And we know that pedestrians are gonna be at greater risk and that's what Beth just talked about. So this is uh, overall crash death rates. Next slide, right? Finally, a quick reference to what we do to support this in the field. Our division, the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity, um, by the good graces of Congress has funded us to do work like this um, in partnerships with Smart Growth America uh, to build safety into the systems that promote what we call activity-friendly routes to everyday destinations. We also uh, want to note, fund a range of other national and state and local and health and community partners. So um, just to note that uh, it's a large network that we're working to support a, a better place so that people, when they make a decision that they want to go for a walk to the store, they don't have to fear for their life. Next slide. Finally, I hope you will join Active People Healthy Nation and keep in touch. All you have to do is Google Active People Healthy Nation and CDC and everything will come up in front of you. Please join the initiative to keep track of what we're doing. So with that, I will turn um, the speaker's mic back over to the moderator. That would be me. Thank you, Ken. And I think it's essential right now to point out that in so many ways, Dangerous by Design only happens because of the partnership we have with the CDC. Uh, one, they are a partner uh, that sponsors uh, Smart, Growth, uh, Smart Growth America, but uh, particularly this work on Dangerous by Design, uh, as well as a lot of our technical assistance. But more importantly, they provide great resources that organizations like mine can utilize in analyzing the system, in uh, you know having access to great research and in tools for our partners at the local level trying to make change. So a big thanks to CDC that made Dangerous by Design possible. Uh, so let's dig a little bit deeper into uh, the findings of the 2022 Dangerous by Design report. Um, first off, uh, we have ranked communities and states based on the number of deaths that occurred, uh, pedestrian deaths that occurred 
per 100,000 uh, people in the population. We are using uh, five years of data, 2016 to 2020, uh, from the Fatality Analysis Reporting System, or FARS, data that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uses. The reason it is 2016 to 2020 is it takes a while for all of the data from a year to come into the FARS system and for them to make sure all of the important uh, connected data is in there, including uh, demographics data, location data, and other things that we use to dig into it and analyze who's being impacted and exactly how. Our rankings are not directly comparable to previous reports, but most places uh, uh, fatality rates are trending worse regardless of our change in ranking. In the past, we have looked at the fatalities based on the number of people walking to work. You may have noticed in 2020, a lot of people didn't go to work. So that number didn't work. And that's why we were looking more in a, a per capita way this time to be able to compare uh, 2020 to years previous. And we went with five years instead of 10 years, which frankly is relatively standard. And you'll notice that that's the time period USDOT uses when evaluating safety uh, trends. So let's jump into the things that people want to know. Where, uh, where are cities on those rankings? The top 20 most dangerous cities are uh, listed here. Before I dig into this, I want to make clear that the United States is by far, far and away, the most dangerous, has the most dangerous roadway system in the developed world. So even if your community is not listed in the top 20, in all reality, they are likely amongst the more dangerous communities in the developed world, and they are likely getting worse. Uh, so please look beyond just the top 20 uh, when uh, you look at dangerous by design, look at where your community is, recognize that their baseline probably wasn't a lot to brag about. And if they're getting worse, that is not a trend you want. But another thing I want to point out, if you look at our top 20, every, every uh, uh, city in the top 20 got worse over this period of time. And uh, you have to go all the way down to that uh, little dotted line we have there. Uh, before you find a community whose uh, uh, danger rate is as bad as our number one community in our last report. So not only are cities getting dangerous, but they're getting a lot more dangerous. Um, 81 metro areas across the 100 that we studied got worse. Only 19 saw lower fatality rates, albeit with marginal decreases. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about states in a minute, but only four states plus the District of Columbia had a decrease in fatalities over the five years that we looked at compared with the previous five years. Um, while there are plenty of examples of successful improvements on specific corridors, doing spot improvements while the overall approach to transportation continues to favor the movement of vehicles at a fast speed only on a corridor, not even the vehicles across a corridor, spot improvements are not enough to overcome an entire system designed around highway style uh, uh, design. And so a lot of communities have something to be proud of in one spot, but that does not translate to the whole system and the whole approach. Uh, on the next slide, you're gonna see where the largest increases uh, in the pre-pandemic versus 2020 death rates, just to show wh which areas were most impacted in 2020 by that uh, increase in the number of people that tried to get outside and be active and healthy. These are communities that before the pandemic would not have seen very many people at all walking to work. As I said before, Areas that did have a high percentage of people walking to work were more likely to see a much lower increase, if not an improvement in their overall exposure to danger. Um, some of these jumps are really outstanding, just uh, astonishingly high and, and disturbing. Uh, if we look at the rankings for states, you're going to notice a, a trend here. Uh, it is uh, the states 
in the, the southern half of the United States. Uh, a lot of that has to do with when that area of the country developed. So much of its development occurred during the highway era, whereas a lot of the communities north of there uh, developed uh, pre-highway era, pre-car even. Um, we see uh, an, an increase across the board. Every one of the top 20 states uh, uh, got more dangerous over the period that we, we looked. And uh, New Mexico, if you look at the lighter uh, orange here, you'll notice that New Mexico was slightly behind Florida, but in spite of Florida's fatalities uh, getting much worse, New Mexico uh, did even worse than that at, to get to number one. Um, again, just because your state is not on this list does not mean it's doing better, does not mean it has a good baseline. It just means somebody else has a worse one. And so uh, I, I invite people to look at uh, the tables we have in the report to see uh, if your state is doing better or worse uh, and uh, if they have a baseline that you are comfortable with, um, which most will not. Um, going on to the next, we'll see the largest increase in pre-pandemic versus 2020 death rates. Uh, and you will see again, these are these are places that did not uh, uh, fare well uh, in 2020, even though driving rates went so far down. Now let's talk a little bit about why this occurs. Roadway design has a huge impact on how we drive. And, and next time you're in a car, which may be even later today, uh, Consider uh, how you are responding to the roadway you are on. Humans, when they see uh, a wide open straight road with no barriers, I mean, that's exactly the way a, a racetrack is designed. So it's natural when you've got that environment to feel comfortable driving faster. Um, we only see speed limits. Uh, you know, along the way, you know, maybe every six blocks, every uh, quarter mile, something like that. But the design is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. Uh, and uh, and so that can impact people's behavior more than the, the speed limit. In fact, we know uh, that often the design and the speed limits conflict, which is why the United States has a term for that. It's called a speed trap. Uh, and uh, the very fact that we all know that term and allow that to continue is uh, is problematic and questionable in my eyes. Um, so you'll notice that other streets, uh, streets do regularly intersect Union, but there aren't any crosswalks or signals because keeping the vehicles along this roadway in Memphis, uh, Tennessee, moving is the priority. And Crossings would slow that down. And the way we judge whether transportation is successful is only based on whether or not those moving within a vehicle along this corridor uh, move at the fastest possible rate. Um, there are also numerous destinations along the way, which means not only will there be pedestrians present, but cars will be turning in and out of traffic and creating this highway-like high-speed design only stays safe if you've got people, uh, if, you've, if you've gotten rid of all those complexities like people walking around and development right up on the road and cross streets and crosswalks and, uh, and driveways. You got to get rid of all of that to safely have high speed, which we do well on interstates and separated highways. I'll also point out marked signalized crosswalks are located as far as 0.4 miles apart potentially requiring a pedestrian to walk 10 minutes round trip just to cross the street. Um, in terms of uh, driver delay, if you have to wait through two lights, which could you know, take you maybe 90 seconds, that's considered unacceptable delay. But to have a, a, someone walking go 10 minutes out of their way is perfectly acceptable. The sidewalks exist here as well, but it's kind of as an afterthought. And those are the things we see. On the positive side, this doesn't sound positive, but I swear it will be positive. 60% uh, of all 2020 deaths occurred on non-interstate arterial highways or roadways like this one in Memphis. Um, the reason that's positive is these roadways may go up only 15% of our roadways, but 60% of the deaths 
That means if we tackle 15% of our roadways, we can reverse this trend. We can uh, we, we can lap some of our uh, Pyrenations and really reverse this trend. This is 15% of roadways we can take. Uh, back to the bad news though, um, the impact of this danger is felt uh, unevenly across the population. Uh, Black Americans are twice as likely to uh, be hit and killed while walking, and uh, Native Americans are three times more likely uh, than white Americans to be hit while wa walking and killed. Uh, in uh, poor neighborhoods, you're significantly more likely to be in danger when you are walking, and you will notice that uh, your danger exposure is directly correlated with your income. If you're wealthy, you can be safer. If you're poor, you are much more likely to face danger. Um, additionally, we see that danger does increase as you age, um, uh, and uh, particularly uh, people who are 75% and over uh, who are more likely to be frail and move slowly uh, are exposed to danger. So those are the basic findings in Dangerous by Design, and we'll be able to answer any questions. But first, I want to hand things over to uh, my friend and colleague, Charles Brown, who is the founder and principal at Equitable Cities, a minority and veteran-owned urban planning, public policy, and research firm focused at the intersection of transportation, health, and equity. He's also an adjunct professor at the uh, Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers. And he's an award-winning expert in planning and policy and has been, you. I know you've seen him or interviewed uh, or heard an interview with him uh, because as we were discussing before we got started, he seems to have mastered the ability to be in two places at once. We're just happy that this is one of those places he could be. Charles, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, as always, it is an absolute pleasure to work with you. Calvin and the rest of your team at Smart Growth America. It's also great to see my, my friend Ken here with the CDC. Um, I clone myself because this is just that important. I want to talk about Forward Together, the importance of centering justice in this work. Um, and by this work, I mean our efforts regarding transportation plans, programs, policies, and et cetera. But first, Two things come to mind when I see these results. First, I'm happy that someone is doing this work, especially someone with the credibility of Smart Growth America. But I'm also saddened by the fact that year after year after year, we're seeing the same results. Black people and Native American people are dying disproportionately. We can focus on a place. But when are we finally going to focus on a people? I arrive at that place because I can't help, secondly, but remember the fact that many of these communities are in the situation that they're in because they have been condemned. They being African-American communities, but also to a lesser degree, Hispanic and Asian communities as well, where in city after city, how highways were built to appease white suburban commuters. And this was enabled through eminent domain and funds from the 1949 Housing Act and the 1956 Interstate Housing Act, which show these communities directly through these black, brown, and low-income communities. And so when I see these stats, when I look forward to these stats, I look forward to them having changed. But what I see instead is that history doesn't say goodbye. For me and other people of color and low-income people across this country, history continues to say, see you later. This though is expected. Why is it expected? Because when you know the history, we know that there is a, a production of transportation injustice. And that production of transportation injustice is a result of procedural injustice distributional injustice, restorative injustice, representational injustice, and recognition injustice. When we look at recognition, 
um, justice, it argues for the existent rights of different cultural and social groups with respect given to these differences in the face of transportation justice or injustice. See, recognition justice considers the damage that has been inflicted by both a lack of recognition and a misrecognition of different social groups within the discourse of transportation equity and justice, which leads us to an understanding of the impact of representative injustice and the need for representational justice. We have to start asking direct questions such as do people feel through these processes and the creation of our highway systems and roads that their experience in their history is represented in this space. If we look historically, we see that it has not. And so what is our obligation as researchers, planners, engineers, et cetera? We have a collective responsibility to elevate the voices of those historically oppressed by this privilege. And our vision of this representational justice has to understand that representation matters and that we all possess the agency to manifest narratives that embody humanity, truth, and respect. Because when we look around, how many Charles do you see, Charles Browns do you see in these conversations across the nation? You see a few, of course, but not enough. And what that result in is we are left with those who have traditionally have the power and the influence continuing to having the power and the influence over the design, the operation, and the programming of our transportation systems. So procedural justice argues for, speaks to this idea of fairness in these processes and our procedures and how people's perception of fairness even is strongly impacted by the quality of their experiences and not only the end result of those experiences. This leads us to a need for distributive justice which is concerned with the fair allocation of these resources that we know exist among diverse members of our community, specifically Black and Native American communities. And this fair allocation shall um, consider or take into account the total amount of goods that are being distributed, the distributing procedure, and the pattern of distribution that results. And it's not enough to just let it happen. We must evaluate it over and over again. Why? Because there is a dire need for restorative justice. Restorative justice within the transportation process focus on the needs of the victims, many of whom are Black, Brown, and low income. It restores them to their original position, or it has the potential to, to, but it will probably never do so. It can be a proactive policy approach to preventing harm and conflict within transportation and mobility if applied and accounted for. See, restorative justice, as we all know, those that do this work, tells us that we have a duty to rectify injustices arising, arising from these transportation decision making. And we have to do that despite the fact that engineers across this country, and I've been in many a rooms have said is behavioral. What you're seeing, these crashes, these fatalities, they're behavioral. They're about the choices that we make, we being the populations that find themselves disproportionately victims of these crashes. That couldn't be further from the truth. Design, design influenced behavior, and these institutions influence the design. And these institutions have been at the backbone of creating the social and political injustices that we know exist today. So what can we do? We gotta have better processes. They must be full and fair participation processes that are led by, that are centered by racialized minority groups. We also need infrastructure investments in maintenance, specifically in minority and low-income communities. I've argued for and will continue to argue for a reparation style infrastructure package for black, brown, indigenous people of color. This can include bicycle infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure, as well as investments in public transit and public art. It cannot however just be an investment. We must also see the maintenance of this infrastructure as well, because we know all too often in these black and brown and low income communities, it is installed and forgotten about. We need it to be maintained. Another action is complete streets. This is how you can find many streets in uh, black and brown communities. This is how they look. 
When you engage community, however, these streets look nothing like what they actually want. What they want is what many people are asking for. Safe places to access their buses, to wait for them, protected street networks, particularly bicycle networks, trees, benches for people, and safe crossing. And also more importantly, the ability to do so any time of the day. But when we talk about transportation, we'd be remiss if we didn't address the issue of the fact that racialized zoning and land use plays a part in this. We can't continue to invest in the suburbanization of our cities without thinking about the impact that it has on both past as well as current decisions in communities, I mean. And because I am a son of Mississippi, and Faulkner was quoted as saying, to understand a place, to first under, excuse me, to first understand the world, you must first understand a place like Mississippi. You see Mississippi is ranked very low, but also many of those Southern communities are ranked very low. It is because when we have these conversations, oftentimes we forget about the rural communities and they go overlooked and they're underfunded, but there were many of our low income populations live and reside and are hoping to thrive, but they're being forgotten about. We can't urbanize this conversation. We have to be considered of all of the communities and the rural communities need our help as well. And we need academics and practitioners to close the gap. We can't do research for the sake of research. Research needs to be in service to people. And once that research is in service to people, we need the practitioners with the political fortitude to manifest a new reality for the people that need it most. And while doing so, let's not forget to also help decriminalize what it means to be active in our communities. Because if we are to improve upon the health statistics that Ken stated, we gotta decriminalize mobility. And that starts with decriminalized cycling because more people out walking and biking hopefully will lead to a more safer environment. So I come back to this image because this is an image now that haunts me. It's a reminder that people of color are disproportionately being killed on our highways year after year after year. The question though is, when will we finally do something specifically for these populations? We need you to do something, why? Because I've said over and over again, until you do something, our mobility will remain arrested. Thank you so much for your time, Beth. Salute to you and the team for all the great work that you're doing. And you know, you can call up on me anytime. Take care. And we will. We definitely will. Charles, we've got some questions here, some of which I really would love your uh, your thoughts on. Um, one uh, that I, I thought was uh, important. Uh, is there a compounding injustice from our past focus on designing streets and roads for people who drive and not for people who don't drive and similar compounding injustice for people who are older people? And before you answer, I'll just say, I don't think it's in the past that we design only for folks who drive. We haven't stopped digging this hole deeper yet while we are trying to spot improve, but I think it's a good question about whether or not past mistakes compound uh, the, uh, or are easily uh, made worse, even when the intention may not have the same overt racism of some of the earlier decisions. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, in answering the question directly, does the compounding results and greater, um, more adverse outcomes for these communities? Absolutely, it does. And one of the reasons why is because they're never mitigated to the degree that they weren't. And so that's why I'm advocating very strongly for more resources to be placed in specifically Black and Native American communities and Hispanic communities as well because that compounding year after year after year on top of a lack of maintenance and disinvestment is the is leading to what we see in the data now, a disproportionate share of fatalities. So until the mitigation is uh, comparable to the impact, we're gonna continue to see, unfortunately, they're, they're being ranked high uh, in these dangers by design reports. 
Yeah, I think that 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 last point is so important, and uh, so many things that you mentioned in your presentation also cause additional problems. You know, if you're in a, a lower power community, an underrepresented community, it's hard to fight for the same changes in design to the roadway, especially when the beneficiaries might be coming from wealthier, more powerful communities, and their goal is to get through your community not to let you move safely within your community. Add that fact, add the fact that poor people and people of color are less likely to have access to a reliable vehicle. And, and I'd like to be specific in the United States of America, it's one reliable vehicle per human 16 and over to be able to survive in this country. So in some households, that might mean four vehicles. If you can't afford four vehicles, there's going to be someone walking around in that community and therefore your exposure is going to be quite high. Yeah, and I would say I don't I don't think we lack access to power. What we lack access to is the political fortitude needed to bring about the change in our community. We have representation in places of power. It just unfortunately has not resulted in the changes that we need to see. So what we really need is greater accountability. We need real champions. We don't need to be hoodwinked or sold out for the sake of a political processes. We need leaders that are willing to speak truth to power and continue to press on until that change manifests. So that's what we need. Agreed. I, I see one question in uh, the Q&A uh, from Odie Dancer III asking whether or not a 501c3 can get access to funding for infrastructure and other projects related to a pedestrian safety mission. And I want to point out that the U.S. Department of Transportation is about to launch a technical assistance program that you might want to look into. Uh, I'll go try to dig up the, the link and post it. Um, but they just recently had uh, a, a webinar about it, and they're planning to put that notice of funding opportunity on the street in the fall. I pay very close attention to that. Uh, and then the other thing is it's very important to partner with your local electeds because when it comes to making changes on a roadway, you want the owners of that roadway involved. So uh, you it's just unlikely to be competitive for you to be able to do a lot of planning if you don't have any buy-in from uh, the, the folks uh, managing that roadway. So any TA uh, money, that technical assistance money you get should be used to bring those electeds and those leaders in so that you can collaborate on making those changes. And I strongly encourage people to pay attention to that opportunity because it's sizable and it will be meaningful. Um, I also saw a question that, uh, on our methodology asking whether or not our analysis of pedestrian crash data takes into account the actual location and cause of the crash, um, including things like uh, uh, pedestrians not being in a crossing, a distracted driver, and other violations. Um, I, oh, I could go on for a long time addressing all of the things that are in this because it's there's a lot of important issues uh, addressed in this one question. One is uh, we do take into account location data. And if you go to our website, you'll see all of the locations of the crashes over our study period mapped. So you can go look at uh, what your community crash uh, locations look like. And I'll tell you what they look like. They go along all of the spines of those big, wide, overbuilt arterial roadways. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, they're practically a map of those arterial roadways. In terms of the cause of the crash, uh, I have two things to say about that. One is uh, the police aren't really trained uh, or uh, given the opportunity to identify uh, uh, design flaws. Um, in, in fact, a lot of times they'll say things like the pedestrian was outside of the crosswalk and failed to mention that there are no crosswalks anywhere or the closest crosswalk is half a mile away. Um, uh, or they might identify the pedestrian as being out of the crosswalk because that's where the pedestrian was found after the crash, uh, not realizing that they might have been hit from many yards away. Um, so there's a lot that's quite challenging uh, in terms of putting this all on the police to figure out and diagnose. I will also say that while there are pedestrians that are killed uh, outside of a crosswalk, most pedestrians are killed inside of a crosswalk. 
Uh, and once the crosswalks become that dangerous, what's the point in, in using the crosswalk? If every place is dangerous, you might as well cross anywhere, which is one of the reasons uh, the, the dangerous design is a disaster. It only encourages more bad behavior because there is no safe place. The other thing about where crossings are, they're often poorly lit, and there might be a place where there's no crossing that's better lit, where you can see traffic better. So this is a, when you design really poorly, uh, these behavioral issues become quite challenging to address because they interact with that design. And, and the last thing I'll say is if you look at, you know, Canada or Australia or, uh, you know, uh, Japan or Korea or so many other of those uh, nations, uh, you know, that uh, work, uh, you know, in have been working much harder than us on Vision Zero, uh, you're gonna find that they have distraction, they have drunk driving, they have reckless drivers. It turns out we're not the only country with the iPhone, we're not the only country with alcohol, we're not the only country with reckless drivers, we are the only country with highways built through our communities as basic roadways in a one-size-fits-all way. And so I look at the differentiator rather than what we have in common because our results are different because of the differentiator, not what we have in common. Um, I don't know, Charles, if you have anything to add to that. I second that. <laughs> um, we also got a question of what efforts are being made to communicate this to DOT at the federal level and the state level. I will tell you, we, uh, we do get uh, broad engagement. Um, when people see these numbers, nobody likes being at the top of uh, our, our ranking. Uh, Florida DOT created a an entire new uh, design guide uh, based on our findings. Uh, they have a lot to reverse, I will say. Um, uh, but they have been starting to try to change their procedures. We're seeing Washington State create new design procedures to be much more uh, thoughtful about how design impacts behavior uh, and, and put in place better practices. Um, uh, but uh, far too often, the response from those who design highways is to blame the user. You know, so, so think about uh, a roadway corner that's designed for you to take a right without having to slow down. We see those all over the place. Uh, what's in the middle of your turn? Uh, a crosswalk. So the design has told you as the driver, no need to slow down here, but stop on a dime. Well, physics prevents that. So inevitably, when you make a mistake as a driver, we blame the driver and the designer gets out scot-free. There are too many times where the design sets up the driver to fail and then we blame the driver. We can design so it's easy to drive safely and hard and uncomfortable to drive unsafely, but we do the reverse. And so a lot of this is about getting into some of the, the rules and regs uh, and practices sometimes practices that aren't even written down and changing them. Uh, I saw another question about guides like the, the Green Book and the Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And uh, we, in working with practitioners at the local level, find that those guides are actual hindrances to doing some of the best practices in uh, making roadways safer. They make it really hard uh, to, to use color and paint to get the driver's attention and show the driver where to look. We're hoping that the update to uh, that document uh, makes some of these things easier. But so far, the guidance really gets in the way and the standards get in the way of these changes. Um, okay, uh, I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, I think uh, there, this is a good question. Though there is an increase in pedestrian fatalities over the years, how does this trend with assumingly growing numbers of people that walk each year? Are the fatalities only growing because there's more pedestrians each year or more of a percentage of pedestrian fatalities growing? That is a great question and an important one. So if I take 2020 off, we did not actually see much of an increase in uh, pedestrian behavior. It was pretty even but we saw pedestrian fatalities growing. 
So the fatalities were higher than the representation of pedestrians uh, out there. In fact, the, the number of pedestrian fatalities is way higher than the percentage of, or the percentage of pedestrian fatalities is way higher than the percentage of pedestrians on our roadways. What we saw in 2020 is an increase in pedestrian activity absolutely everywhere, but some places, those that were more dangerous before, those that did not accommodate walking to work in big numbers, they got way more dangerous. And those that had had a lot of walking before and were a lot more accommodated in walking and had a lot more people walking to work did not see the same increases. So we do see a connection with um, uh, uh, the, the design. I, Charles, I also think about you know, we are more likely to see people walking in uh, uh, Black communities, Native American communities, lower income communities where people just don't have access to as many cars. And yet we see that those are the very places uh, where the roadways are higher speed and wide and there aren't a lot of crossings and people are exposed to danger. When you're working with cities, uh, what level of of understanding do you see from leaders of that fact? One of the things that is hard to overcome as it relates to the context in which you just um, provided, Beth, is that we have to look at, quite frankly, why do we have an auto-centric environment? A lot of it has to do with the fact that the people who design our streets, who engineer our streets, and enforce our streets, and I'll throw in there those who report on the crashes of our streets are disproportionately people who drive. And so a lot of times when you go in these environments, what you hear, quite frankly, is why are people walking and biking to begin with? That is particularly true in the rural South. Whenever you see someone walking and they're not, or biking, and they're not doing so particularly for exercise. So there's a culture of harm, a culture of otherness, because the car is king, the truck is king, and it is a status symbol. Therefore, the people that are walking and biking are so vulnerable on our streets because many people question why they're there to begin with. And so what we need is we need better reporting on these crashes. We don't need the episodic approach that news and media takes in framing a narrative that is victim blaming. We also need engineers, planners, and law enforcement to actually walk and bite the communities where they're responsible for the design of it. Perhaps then it will lead to greater empathy and understanding regarding the particular challenges that they are facing, not only during the day when it's convenient for them to do those walk audits, but also at night when it better reflects the reality of what it means to be vulnerable. That is, uh, it's, it's such a good point. I, and I, I think uh, of a lot of the articles I have read about uh, fatalities involving people walking or, or rolling uh, in a wheelchair. And it often will talk about things like the time of day. And, and they'll say things like, uh, uh, not clear why this person was walking this late at night, but no question about why the driver was driving that late at night. They were out because people have places to go. And apparently it's okay to have a place to go late at night in a car, but it's not so okay on foot. And, and I, there's just so much in the reporting that just keeps reinforcing that bias and takes the blame off of of the, the facility or the area, there's rarely any reporting about how many crashes have taken place in that area. So it looks like an accident or a one-off rather than a crash that is preventable. Um, I did see someone raise the point about the size of vehicles, and I have not yet pointed out that in our report, we partner with a bunch of different folks to talk about related issues to the design of roadway and how it impacts uh, safety or lack thereof. Um, we, uh, we worked with uh, uh, strong towns to talk about what it is that leads danger, uh, engineers in the wrong direction. What are the standards they're held to and how are they trained to think about what makes a successful roadway? And uh, one way that you know that pedestrians don't count is we don't count them. 
just getting data on how many people are walking is extraordinarily hard and has been a challenge for for us on every dangerous by uh, yeah dangerous by design report. Um, we don't count; it doesn't count. Uh, and so uh, it's hard to measure how successfully we're moving people on foot because we we don't uh, we don't judge our success based on that. But another partnership was with America Walks, and it talks specifically about the growing size of vehicles and not just how big they are, but how the hood is designed, according to some companies saying this has been said in public and in the press to be, quote, intimidating. Um, and they are. They're terrifying. Uh, but strangely enough, the National Highway Safety Traffic Administration rates them as safe in spite of the fact they have something called a front blind spot. A front blind spot is a spot where the driver can't see what is in front of their vehicle. Uh, and we have reached a point in the United States where a front blind spot, something that blinds the driver to what is in front of them, is not only acceptable, but rated as a five-star safe uh, vehicle, according to the federal government. Uh, and yet again shows that we're really not we're not thinking about the people outside of a vehicle, but we're also not thinking much about the driver who we we continuously set up to fail. Um, we also partnered with the Fines and Fees Justice Center talking about why designing for bad behavior and then uh, uh, enforcing your way out of it furthers the very injustices that Charles was talking about. And Charles, I don't know if there's anything you want to talk about with regard to enforcement, which I know is at least I, open, if not 10. In enforcement, our mobility has been arrested. Um, we we can't, you know, just stick to the traditional form of enforcement when we're having this conversation. As I have argued, as it relates to arrest and mobility, we have to also look at the policies that segregate us racially and spatially. We also have to look at the polity how our neighbors treat us when we're out and about. But I wanna go back to the trucks that you mentioned and how intimidating they look. I can't help but think yet again, the insecurities of men lead to fatalities. You know, the, the ego, the insecurities of having a bigger than thou truck and how that is unfortunately causing so much pain and trauma in this country, man, we gotta get it together. Uh, address your insecurities before you kill someone. Well, and and I will uh, surprisingly be the one here to defend uh, the guys and say we're not giving them very good information. We are telling them on a federal site that this is the safest vehicle out there while acknowledging that it has a front blind spot. In my world growing up, a front blind spot is uh, something that should make a car not roadworthy. Full stop. You should be able to see what's in front of your car. I, I, I can't believe that this is a questionable thing. So I think that we can do a lot more uh, to improve just informing the customer about what they're getting into when they purchase these things. I They are assuming that it wouldn't be allowed on the road and get a, a high rating if it were so dangerous. I will, uh, recognizing we are running out of time, I believe, um, just say a, a, a handful of things. Uh, one is um, the, the fourth partner that we had in our report is the National Association of City uh, Transportation Officials, and it is a real bright spot. It is directions on where to start. And they're the ones that really talk about how it's a small minority of our roadways that are unsafe. Um, it, it is it is these highway style roadways that we build in our communities. If we want to build a highway safely, we pioneered that in this country. Our separated highways and interstates are extraordinarily safe. We separate oncoming traffic. We manage how people, how drivers come on and off of uh, the highway. We make sure it doesn't happen too frequently. We sure as heck don't put buildings right up against the highway and have drive uh, driveways every 12 to 24 feet. Um, you know, we know how to do speed safely, but if you want speed, you have to have the simplicity and straightforwardness of that highway, that separated highway. And if you want safety in a complex environment like you find in rural towns and villages, small cities, mid-sized cities, and large cities, you gotta slow down that traffic. 
It's as, it's as simple as that. And if we just tackle those 15% of roadways that are built like highways in a complex environment and are responsible for the majority of those fatalities, we can reverse this. We can reconnect communities. We can make it possible for those that can't uh, access a reliable car or, uh, or don't want to spend their money that way allow them to reach opportunity as well as anybody inside of a car. There were so many amazing questions in this Q&A. I believe we ended up with close to 100, uh, actually a little bit over 100. And uh, uh, I want to tell you that we are going, we are looking at them and we are going to be following up on this webinar with uh, a, a follow-on reports and blog posts and put blog posts and partnerships that hopefully will answer many of those questions um, uh, because uh, you all have brought up so many things that are really important. Some things are actually addressed in the report and I really invite you to look through it and, uh, and see what resources you can find there. Again, I wanna thank Charles who I will continue to find absolutely every excuse to work with um, and uh, invite everyone to check out his work at Equitable Cities, which is uh, just extraordinary. And we really do need a lot more Charles Browns out there. Um, and I again wanna thank uh, uh, CDC for making this report possible uh, and supporting our work both with uh, a, a sponsorship, but also with all of the resources and partnerships that they provide through their networks. And finally, I really wanna thank uh, all of those I work with here at Smart Growth America, many of which are helping to manage uh, this webinar in the background and were the, the chief authors of this report, including Ebony Vinson and uh, Ray Labellis and others within our organization and uh, Eric Kova and Steve Davis, uh, who uh, are, are our comms leads, um, couldn't do it without them. So thank to everybody for joining us today. Uh, we look forward uh, to being able to answer more of your questions and staying in touch.